Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where if you're at home but wish you were in a science lab, well, boy, do we have the class for you. We are live at the Omaha Children's Museum, where instructor Ben is going to show you how to turn your home into a science lab, doing experiments and demonstrations with objects you'll find laying around the house so you can learn and explore science wherever you are. Now, just a couple of things. Ben wants to keep this really interactive. So if you take a look to the right of the window here that we're in with the video, you'll see there's a chat box in a polling area. Please, he's going to ask you some questions to make sure we find out what you know and want to know about these experiments and how yours are going. And so with that, please keep it interactive in the chat panel there. If you have any questions whatsoever about the experiments we do or anything about Omaha Children's Museum, type those in whenever you have them in the last 10 minutes or so. I'll interview Ben with your questions to get you as many answers as we can. And I guess the last instruction is let's have some fun with all this. So let me introduce you to your instructor for today, Ben at Omaha Children's. Hi, everybody. I am so excited to work with you guys today and to show and share with you some really cool science experiments that you can try at your house. So I'm coming to you from the Omaha Children's Museum here in Omaha, Nebraska, and this is our home science lab activity. So we're gonna talk about how we can be a scientist and discover the world around us while at the comfort of our house. You see, you don't have to be a scientist in a lab or at a school. You can be a scientist wherever you are when you're making discoveries around you. Now, one way before we get into this, I want to talk about how do we make those observations? How do we come up with things that science tells us? How do we find answers to questions that we want answers to? And that is through experiments. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a whole bunch of experiments. Well, these experiments are all going to be things that you can try at your house with an adult's help, of course but they're gonna be based off of materials that you may already have at home or can easily find in a grocery store. So let's go ahead and get started. The first experiment test that I wanna do has to deal with a cabbage and these mystery liquids right here. This is called a pH balance experiment. Now pH is what we call the measuring scale that we use to measure something is acidic or basic. And let me break that down a little bit further. So an acid or something that is acidic is something that maybe can cause corrosion. It's something that is usually sour to the taste if you do end up tasting it. It's a solution or a liquid that has some qualities to it that make it considered to be an acid. And these are maybe things like on cartoons where you see acid on cartoons, but they could also be things like vinegar. Vinegar is an acid or lemon juice. Lemon juice is really acidic. That's why it's so sour. Then we also have things called bases. And a base is kind of the opposite. It's something that is probably kind of bitter to the taste buds. It's something that is maybe slippery or slick, kind of like soap. Something like baking soda is what we call a base. And today we're going to experiment with vinegar and baking soda, but not in the way that maybe you're used to. Vinegar and baking soda, they usually react together to create bubbles, maybe a volcano. We're not doing a volcano today. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to use the juice from this cabbage right here to determine whether or not what is in my vial is an acid or a base. Now I'll tell you this. I don't know which vial is which. In fact, even just to be sure, I'll mix them up a little bit, just so I can't remember exactly which is which, right? They look pretty identical to me. I prepared these a while ago, but one of them is vinegar and one of them is baking soda dissolved in water. To figure out which one is which, I'm going to use my testing liquid, this cabbage juice right here. Now I got the cabbage juice by boiling some water in the cabbage and it made it all kind of smelly in here. And then, I took it and I put it in a little cup here. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour it on in here and we should see a color change happen pretty instantly. So let's see here. So we have a reddish color right here. I'll hold up my lab coat so we can see just how red that is. We have a red color right here and we have, let's see what color this one turns. Like a blue green right here. Well, my blue green is the base. 
So if I use this solution, if I pour it into something that is basic or that has basic qualities to it, it's gonna turn a blue green color. So I know this was my baking soda and I know this was my vinegar because it turned a red color. It turned that color that it would if it was acidic. So there's some chemistry at home. Before we move off of chemistry, I'm gonna bring up another idea of chemistry at home. And that has to do with this thing right here. Do you know what this is? This is a bottle of sunscreen. Sunscreen, we use it when it's hot outside or when the sun is shining, we put it on our skin to keep us from getting burnt by the sun's rays. And that's because the sun emits a type of light called ultraviolet light or UV light as we might refer to it today. So that ultraviolet or UV light is what irritates our skin. It's what causes us to be burnt. Well, sunscreen can come in a couple different forms. There are organic compound sunscreens that have uh, elements in them like zinc that help to reflect the sun. So sunlight can be reflected off of you and that UV light then gets reflected back into the atmosphere so it doesn't ever touch your skin. Well, there's another type of sunscreen, and this is more common, made out of various chemical solutions that absorb that UV light. And when I mean they absorb it, I mean you put it on your skin and before the UV light can get to your skin, the sunscreen itself has already absorbed that light. Well, to test that, in my lab today, I'm gonna use a special light, but you could test this at your house and I'm gonna tell you how to do it in a little bit. Now on this piece of paper, I have three lines drawn and they are the sunscreen. They're somewhere on here. I can't really tell because it blended in with the paper, it dried. But I am gonna be able to tell when I turn off the lights and I use my special UV light right here. So I'm gonna turn off the lights. We're gonna switch over to that overhead camera Perfect. So we have our paper right here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on my light and we're gonna be able to see now where that sunscreen is. So these dark spots are where I put that sunscreen. They are the spots where the sunscreen is at. The reason they're darker instead of all around us, the rest of the white paper is reflecting this blue purplish light. And we're able to see that reflection coming in through the camera. But the darker spots, well, they're not reflecting that light. It's not bouncing off of the paper. It's actually being absorbed. Just like sunscreen would when it's on your body, it would absorb that light, causing it to be a darker color on the paper than it would be normally. Now, I told you you could try this at your house and I'm gonna explain how when I get the lights back on, there we go. So you can try this experiment out at your house if you have a little black light or UV light, you could totally use that and put it on paper. But what you could also do is you could take some construction paper. So construction paper looks like a color, kind of like this. You see, I drew a little smiley face on mine earlier. So you could take some construction paper, you could put a handprint of some sunscreen or maybe do a little design and then put it out in this hot summer sun. Well, after a while, construction paper tends to pale in its color. It tends to lose the brightness of the color when it comes in contact with sunlight. But the places that you've put that sunscreen on, they're not going to lose that color. In fact, they will stay just as bright as the paper was when you initially took it out from a dark room in your house and it wasn't all pale already. You could do this in the winter as well, but it might take a couple of days before you can really see the effects. On a really hot summer day, it maybe will only take a day or two so you can actually see those prints right there. And if you do try this at home, you could try different types of sunscreens, different types of levels. So you could do different levels of protection and see if it helps keep that color of the paper as true to the paper color as it was when you started. But the same concept's gonna happen. The sunlight's going to be absorbed by the sunscreen instead of go into the paper and pale that paper. So it's gonna use that same concept. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next experiment today. My next experiment is based off of this idea of absorption. I have an, a question about absorption. So absorption is when you absorb something. So a sponge, a sponge, a sponge absorbs water. 
it fills up with water and it can hold that water and carry it. A towel is absorbent. It helps dry off your hands or maybe after you get out of the pool, you use a towel. There are lots of things that are absorbent. Well, today I'm gonna to talk about a compound called sodium polyacrylate and it is an absorbent compound. Now, again, everything that I am using today you can find either at your house or at your local grocery store. You may not find a container like this with sodium polyacrylate, but you might find something else. I'm gonna tell you what that is after our experiment because I don't wanna give it away. So what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna start with these two cups. Each of them has a coffee filter on the top of the cup. Now a coffee filter is porous, which means it doesn't absorb water, it lets water run through it. That's why you might use it for coffee. You might put coffee grounds in it and then you pour the water, the water trickles down with the coffee bean juice or what have you. I don't know, I don't drink coffee, you probably don't either. But moving on from that discussion, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this cup right here and I'm gonna pour this water. Now I made it blue, it's regular water. I just added some blue dye to it so we could see it better. But I'm gonna pour it on in here and I want you to watch if you can see the water start to trickle down into the glass. So I can see it on the shadow. I actually might get a little bit closer to the camera here. Hopefully not too close. Yeah, let's try this here. So you can see the drips and the drops coming on through there, just like so. So the point of this is to say, my coffee filter, not absorbent. It's gonna let that water go through. Well, I wanna use something that is absorbent. I'm gonna use a sodium polyacrylate. I'm gonna take a spoonful, a nice rounded spoonful. I'm gonna put it right on top of here. And I'm actually gonna do two-ish spoonfuls. Um, that was, there we go, okay. If this really is absorbent, like I say it is, if I am correct, then we shouldn't have any water droplets fall into the cup like we did with our last event. I'm gonna have a switch over to our overhead camera so that way we can see what it might look like from up top here. So I'm gonna have you guys have your, your eyes on that and we're gonna go ahead and start pouring this on in here. So I'm pouring in the water. I'm trying to go just as fast as I went with the other one. And it's turning that powder into sort of a gel. It's absorbing that water and it's growing actually and filling up the top of my cup with all of that gel, just like that. It kind of looks like a snow cone of sorts. I'm gonna go ahead and come out up to the front camera here. We'll switch back to that camera. I'm gonna go ahead and move up a little bit closer. So you guys can get a really good look of what that looks like. So we have our polyacrylate on top there. I'm gonna keep putting in that water. For anybody that was thinking, well, of course he's showing us the overhead picture, then we can't see any water drop in there. Still no water, right? Still no blue water coming into through the coffee filter, but it is continuing to grow on top here. It's getting so saturated. You see polyacrylate can absorb up to 300 times its weight in water. In fact, I'm actually dripping water off of my cup, trying to tip it on down to show you guys what it looks like. I might move back to the overhead camera here so you guys can see. It is looking like a nice, lovely pile of goo. It's absorbing this water. And if I take it out, I can even show you a little bit what it looks like. I still don't have any water in the cup, still hasn't gone in there. In fact, I haven't even reacted with all of that sodium polyacrylate but it's kind of like a jelly. It's kind of like a gel. It's sort of bouncing around. It absorbs all of that water so other things can stay dry. In fact, my hand after holding it, my hand's still dry. It's really not releasing any water. It's not dripping like a sponge is. There's no drips coming off of it. So it's able to be super, super absorbent, which is really, really important for what this compound is used for. We'll go ahead and head back to me on the camera there. I'm gonna wipe my hands off. The big reveal here is I told you to buy this at your grocery store. You might have it at your house. You see sodium polyacrylate is used in diapers. Yes, that's right. 
diapers, like what a baby would wear. It's kind of gross. It's used in diapers because it's really, really absorbent. I'm not gonna get too graphic about this, but we all know what happens in a diaper. It gets full of water. And instead of having that water escape or dampen the clothing of who's ever wearing that diaper, it is absorbed by the sodium polyacrylate inside of that diaper, just like so. Just like our sodium polyacrylate absorbed that water and didn't let it drip down into that coffee filter or into the cup, I mean, through the coffee filter. Okay, our next experiment. This is one that you've maybe seen before. This is called elephant toothpaste. Now, a lot of people have seen elephant toothpaste done maybe online or by uh, another teacher or a scientist. But today I'm gonna show you a way that we can do it at home. Because when you watch it online or if you watch another scientist do it, it's really kind of explosive. And they use chemicals that we don't typically wanna touch with our hands or maybe have around uh, a younger kids. And so here is an example of how you can do this, this experiment without using super harsh chemicals, just things found at the grocery store. I'm gonna start with my hydrogen peroxide. I'm only using a 3% solution of hydrogen peroxide. So by the band-aids or whatever, maybe the laundry, you'll find the solution. I'm gonna pour in a fair amount of my solution in here. Just, that feels like a good, well, a little bit more. Now, typically, we would do this with a much higher grade of sodium or sodium of hydrogen peroxide. And that hydrogen peroxide, I don't wear gloves for, I want to have my safety glasses on for. For all the chemicals I'm using today, I'm not too concerned. So we have that in my little water bottle today. Also, typically I would use like a nice little glass jar or flask, but you may not have that at your house. Because who has a who has a scientific flask at their house? I sure don't. So water bottle. Just like I said, you can do this all from things at your house. I'm going to add in a little bit of soap. I'm just using some dish soap. That's going to help it bubble up. So elephant toothpaste is a bubbly reaction. So if you haven't seen it before, it's this bubbly reaction that when two chemical compounds react together, they create this gas. They produce a gas and that gas then fills up the bubbles and creates a bubbly foam spewing out of whatever container you have it inside of. I'm gonna add a little bit of color to ours so it looks nice and pretty when we end up reacting it. I'm gonna add a little bit of red coloring to it. Mix it around again, there we go. Now it's time to add in what we call our catalyst or the beginning ingredient, the ingredient that's gonna start that reaction. So I'm gonna add in this catalyst right here. It is yeast and some warm water. That's all it is, just baking yeast and warm water. I'm gonna pour it on in here. Maybe we'll cut to the overhead here and we'll watch it, we'll watch it flow. There we go. We're gonna watch it kind of flow out of here. So like I said, it's not the most explosive reaction version of that reaction, but it is one of the safest reactions. And you can see the effects of it, I can touch with my hand, it's not gonna burn me or anything, it's all right. Ordinarily, this is an exothermic reaction, it means it produces heat. So when we use harsher chemicals to produce this reaction, we get this exothermic or heat producing reaction. Well, today, this is totally fine. I can touch it, it's, it's totally fine. It's not hot, it's not gonna burn me, because when I use the other chemicals we use today, the yeast and the low percentage of hydrogen peroxide, it simply just makes a diluted form but it still has that foaming bubbly reaction that we all like to see. So lots of fun, highly recommend trying that one at home. I'm gonna go ahead and move this and hopefully not make a mess while I do so. There we go. Wipe my hands off on my rag. All righty. I think it's time for some more science experiments. This one is kind of fun to try. This is a neat looking experiment that I would classify as something that looks sort of like a lava lamp. Now a lava lamp is something that 
used to be much more popular back in the day. Still is around now, though. It's a little lamp that is full of some goo and some colors. And when you turn it on, the bubbles all bubble up in our different colors. And it looks pretty neat. Well, I'm going to do a similar reaction today. But I'm going to do this reaction using some baby oil and water and food coloring. So I'm gonna gently pour in the baby oil so it doesn't mix too much with the water. Now, oil and water, they don't really mix very well. They tend to separate. And we're gonna be able to see that separation. I'm gonna come up close to you here in just a moment and show you that separation. But I don't wanna pour this in too quick because I don't want to have to wait for that separation to happen. I just want it to already be separated. All right, so we have our water on the bottom Oil is less dense than water. So it sits right on top of there. So you can see that separation. So here's that water and here is that oil right on top. So we have that separation between the oil and the water just like so. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in a couple droplets of our food coloring right here. And it's just gonna kind of sit right on top of that oil. Some of it might sink down into the water that's okay. So right now we're using oil, we're using water, a cup, and some food coloring. And the last thing that I'm going to use is something called an Alka-Seltzer tablet. An Alka-Seltzer tablet is like a little foamy tablet. If I'm being honest, I don't actually know what they're used for. I only use them for science. But they're sold at the store. They have a purpose. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this on in here. And we can start to see that reaction take place. So it's going to start to bubble. So when it reacts with the water, it begins to bubble up. And when it bubbles up, it's going to take that color and it's going to move that color up into the oil and sort of create that lava lamp look, that, that bubbly, fizzy, uh, colorful look, just like so. And the bubbles go up and they fall back down. Those bubbles are full of air and water, and so they're going to sink down back through that oil as they're denser than the oil is. And it's really sort of starting to fizz up on that side here. Let me turn it this way. So we can see that reaction take place a little bit more. So it's creating that bubbly effect, and it's just kind of cool to look at. And you can do this again and again and again. Once it's done reacting, those compounds will stay separate, and they're not going to... Uh, uh, you know, combine together in any way. So you could always add another tablet in there after a while, watch it fizz and foam again. It's just kind of a neat little reaction to look at as uh, you use these little tablets right here. So I'll let that keep reacting, but it's pretty cool. Something that you can easily try at home. Doesn't require anything you probably don't already have at your house. The other thing with Alka-Seltzer tablets that we can do is we can create sort of an alka seltzer tablet rocket of sorts. Now, what I mean by that is this. I have this little film canister right here. Now you may not have this at your house. They're not really that common anymore. But any container that has a little snap lid would probably work just fine. A nice little small container like this. I like to use these because they're the right size for my tablet right here. Now in the reaction we just watched, the science behind that was the Alka-Seltzer tablet, when it reacts with the water, when the tablet reacts with the water, it produces a gas, and that gas then is this bubbly air, it's the air bubbles that you see bubbling up into our lava lamp. Well, the Alka-Seltzer tablet is gonna do the same thing in my container right here. I'm gonna have it react with some more water. I'm gonna drop my tablet on in here, just like so. I'm gonna have it react with some water, and then I'm gonna put a lid on it. So all the bubbles, all the foam you saw happen in our other experiment just a second ago are going to happen inside of this container, but they're not going to have anywhere to escape. And eventually, they're going to build up enough pressure to force my little canister to pop up into the air. And it's going to happen kind of quick. So I encourage you to have your eyes ready to go because once it pops, it's going to go. So I'm going to flip it on over. I'm going to stand on back. We're going to wait and see and watch what happens. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but as soon as it goes, it's gonna go. It's gonna go really quick. So as it's reacting, I'm gonna get another one set up here. Woo! There it goes. So it popped off just like that. Let's see if we can't 
watch that happen again. Are you ready? I'm gonna put another one in here. Oof me. A little bit of water, my cap back on. I'm gonna set it just like that. I'm gonna wait and wait and wait. We're gonna keep waiting. Hopefully it'll react. Like I said, it'll take a while for it to build up that pressure, but once it does, it's going to pop that off just like that. Perfect, couldn't have done it better. That was wonderful. So it shoots right off and flies off of the can just like so. All right, I'm making a little bit of a mess here. I'm gonna move some things around. Mm, let's move this over here. Fantastic. Okay, so the next couple things I want to show you are some really neat science experiments that you can try at home, but they're also kind of like science magic tricks. So I have two other things I want to show you today before we're all through. The first one is making something invisible. Yes, I know. Crazy. We're going to make something invisible. This next experiment, we are going to explore the concepts of light. We're going to explore light refraction and reflection. So the two words that I want to define before we get to our next experiment. Light reflection is when light reflects and bounces off of something back at you or back at an object. So if you look into a mirror, the light reflects off of your skin, into the mirror, it bounces off the mirror and reflects them back to your eyes and you're able to see your reflection in a mirror. Well, there's also light refraction. Refraction is when light bends and passes through a medium or passes through objects. So some objects like glass have light refraction qualities to them. They let the light pass through them instead of reflecting back at you like a glass window would, um, or a glass window is like this, you can see through a window, they are letting the light pass through there, it's bending the light. Well, light reflection for like a mirror, if you look at it. Right now, we're gonna do an experiment using light refraction. Right now, I have my jar right here. Now this requires two key things. You need Hyrex glass and you need vegetable oil for this invisibility experiment. I have my Pyrex glasses right here, my containers right here. Now, what you're actually seeing in the camera here, you're not really seeing the jar. You're not really seeing the test tube right here. What you're seeing is light bend through it and around it, and that's causing your eyes to register a shape, but you're not necessarily seeing the actual glass being reflected back to you. Well, what I want to do, and maybe we can actually uh, zoom in a little bit on our camera, if that's possible, just to get a little closer view of this. <clears throat> what we can do is we can look in at our test tube right here. I'm going to dip it on in here. And I think it's at the top there. And it should be a little toggle on the top of the camera. Maybe not. That's all right. What we're going to do is we're going to take our little test tube. I'm going to dip it on in here. Now, right now, you can see the test tube. You can see it in the oil. Again, the oil sitting on top of water, and you can see it in the water. And you can actually see it pretty well in the camera. So we're, we're all right. That's all good. So you can see it pretty good in that view here. We can still see that and that. That's because even though it's refracting some light, it's also reflecting light right now still. So you're able to see the light being reflected back at you. It's not refracting all of that light. Not all the light is passing through it. Some of it is bouncing back at the camera lens, bouncing back to my eyes so I can see it. So we're able to see it just like this. But when I add in some vegetable oil into my test tube, now watch nice and careful. Now 
that test tube becomes invisible. You can see it on the bottom. You can see it right here, but you can't see it where that vegetable oil is. It's still all right here, still right here, still perfect. But as I dip it on in here, it seems like it disappears. The reason for this is because, I'll add another one in there for comparison. So this one doesn't have any oil in it. I'm gonna drop it on in here. You can still see both of them, right? And this one does have the oil and you can't see the backside of this one. The reason for this is because the moment of refraction or the refraction index for the oil is the same as my pyrex glass. And so the light doesn't bend or reflect any differently than it does when it passes through the oil than when it passes through the outside of my test tube. It just keeps moving straight on through. We don't see any difference in that bend and that doesn't tell our eyes then that there's anything there. We don't see any other shapes. So it appears as if my test tube has gone invisible. And you can do this at home with two different cups. You can do this at home with uh, some measuring cups and some vegetable oil on your own. If I had an entire container of vegetable oil and didn't have any of that water, then you wouldn't be able to see any of that at all. I'm gonna come up a little bit closer. I know you guys can see it just fine, but I wanna really make sure this reaction gets across so you can kind of see a little bit closer, but not really. It's really hard to tell where that test tube is at. You can see it kind of when I dip it in there, but at some point it just kind of disappears. You don't really see it anymore. You can see the blue, the blue label on it, but otherwise it's gone. So we're able to use that refracting light as a way to change how we see an object inside of a medium or inside of a solution. All right, so that's magic science trick number one. Magic science trick number two is kind of a fun one that you can use for mom and dad or maybe on a friend. And it requires two balloons and two plastic bottles. So I have this plastic bottle right here and this one right here. And this is called getting a balloon in a bottle. How do you get a balloon in a bottle? I don't know, I had somebody else put them in here. But what I do know is this, one of these will inflate the balloon and one will not. Now I know which one it is, it's the green one. I'm gonna go ahead and inflate my balloon right here. There we go. And it deflated again right back there, right? Let me try that again. We're able to see that balloon be inflated inside of the bottle. I'm gonna take the air back out of the balloon. There we go. This one should work the same way then, right? This one should be perfect. The same bottle looks like the same thing, same type of balloon. So here we go. Mm, let me try it again. Well, this one didn't work. Let me, one more time, one more time. No inflation. Well, even though these bottles look the same, there is a difference. The green balloon bottle actually has a hole poked at the bottom of it. And that hole is really, really important because my balloon acts as a seal. It acts like a cap on top of my bottle. It's not letting any more air or uh, water or anything in there, right? I could pour, I could put this in a bathtub and it would stay full of air. I could put it in a pool and it would stay full of air. It acts as that cap. It's not allowing anything else to get into this bottle. But the one that has a hole allows for me to change the pressure in the bottle. So the hole is right here, but if I cover up that hole, I'm not able to blow up the balloon. That's because I'm not able to change the pressure. I'm not able to add more to the balloon or inside of the bottle. There's plenty of air in the bottle and there's plenty of mass and substance inside of each of these bottles. It just happens to be air molecules inside the bottle instead of balloon. But that means I can't add any more air into the bottle, into this. Well, this one with the hole, when I blow into the balloon, the air comes out of this hole 
and allows room for the balloon to inflate. This is a fun little trick that you can pull out and maybe take over to a friend's house or to uh, up to your sibling or mom or dad and say, hey, I can do this thing. I bet you can do it too. And then give them the one that has the hole in it, right? And they'll be like, well, how did you do it? And you can explain to them the pressure changes in the bottle. Those are the experiments that I have planned to show you that you can try at home. When we see you next time, I'll be doing experiments that you should not try at home because they'll be different and probably use more chemicals and explosive things. But today I wanted to show you some things that you can do at home to be a scientist well on your own. So thank you for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and toss it on back over for our question time. Hey, thank you. That was some mind blowing stuff there. That's uh, especially you mentioned those last two were magic and they, uh, they totally felt like magic. And uh, hey, everybody out there, you've had some great questions. Please keep asking those. We'll get as many answers as we can. And actually, Ben, that last comment you made about these are some tricks you can do at home. And in the next class, maybe I'll show you some tricks you can't do at home. A few people wanted to know, how do you know before you do it if an experiment or demonstration is dangerous? If we've got things we want, somebody had to create these experiments. Um, if we wanted to try to be exploratory scientists, how do we know we're not setting ourselves up for some kind of injury or worse? Sure thing. So um, my general rule of thumb is, is a couple different rules. Uh, I do a lot of different experimenting and I try a lot of new things for the museum as I'm writing different curriculum or writing up shows for you guys. And I try to base my judgment off of a couple different things. The first one is lots of research. So a lot has been done and that doesn't mean you shouldn't discover things for yourself. If you wanna know something, test it out, right? But you should maybe look something up to see if, if you wanna try out something with a certain chemical if it's dangerous, or if you wanna try something out, um, you know, use your general safety skills. If you're gonna use the stove, maybe think it through a little bit. You know, maybe don't put anything that might burn on the stove, plastics or what have you. Um, I also try to stay clear. If I'm gonna do something that I know might catch on fire, uh, I make sure that I'm wearing proper safety equipment or maybe doing it outside, uh, just trying to keep those in mind. So I know if it's anything that's fire related, I try to stay away from when I'm doing things at my house because I don't want any sort of accident to happen at my house. Here at the museum, I have a couple different stations that are sort of set up with fire extinguishers and prepared for those sorts of incidents. But uh, when I'm doing things at home or testing things, you know, that's an outside idea. Or, or you may just wanna ask a grown up because for a lot of these experiments, even though you can do all of this at home, you probably should get some permission first. You may not want to use the cabbage you're gonna use for dinner um, to make some pH balancing uh, solution, right? Or maybe you may not wanna use all of mom's vegetable oil to test out invisible glass. So always ask for permission when you're doing things at home. Awesome. I like that rule to ask for permission. You mentioned that they're in the, you know, at the museum, in the lab, you've got all kinds of safety equipment that might not be readily available at home. So ask for permission, ask a grown up for help. And, um, you know, and, and like you said, do some research and know what's out there. There are plenty of great safe experiments like what you showed us today to, to really indulge your love of science. And then when, uh, you know, teachers in, in labs at school and things like that have more uh, flexibility with the safety equipment, they can show you that. Exactly. So, awesome. Hey, one specific one on, um, on I think, the uh, the disappearing test tube. Someone wanted to know, would it work with, did it have to be vegetable oil? Or are there other substances that it might work with? I think they, they mentioned maybe syrup. Is it, does it have to do with the consistency of the vegetable oil or what other things should we be looking for if we want to try substitutes? So in my research, um, what I've found is that vegetable oil works all right. Baby oil is supposed to work. I haven't tried baby oil, um, but I suppose it would work. I wonder, you know, that that's a great question about that syrup and kind of just that same medium. I'm sure that part of it has to do with the color too. So it being a colored substance kind of helps it mask that, you know, if I put maybe red coloring in something and I put it on in there, that might help a little bit. But I would say, give it a test, try it out. That's one of those things that sounds like a safe thing to try. Syrup's not really dangerous. It's not flammable. I'd say go for it, right? I like that. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good, you know, to back to your rules of thumb, like 
it's hard to get injured by syrup. So if you know an experiment works with one thing, you can vary up the inputs a little bit as long as you know they're safe. That's a great way to be a scientist discovering new things there at home. So uh, so you've got the, the green light to check that out. Of course, syrup is sticky and could be expensive. So uh, please ask for permission. But yes. uh, that's a, a good one to uh, to be able to try. Hey, one question I thought was, was pretty interesting was you, know, you talked about um, – uh, absorbent materials before um, with liquid. And someone asked, is there anything that absorbs gases or anything that absorbs solids? Is absorption limited to just liquids or does it happen with uh, with other um, you know types of substances? That is a really interesting question. And I, I wish I could have a better answer for you. But off the top of my head, let me think here. Anything that could absorb solids or uh, uh, gases? That's a really interesting question. Um, let me see here. I got a friend that looks like she's, she's working on something and wants to give me an answer. But I, uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure there are. I, I can almost guarantee you there's something. I think absorbing a liquid might be something that's kind of uh, more challenging to do. I think absorption would maybe lend better to a gas or to a liquid. Uh, I think about like an ice cube. I don't know what would absorb an ice cube until the ice cube turns into water. I think that's the only thing that I can... Uh, kind of compare that to, you know, I don't know what would absorb a rock for solid, for instance, for a solid, but I sure think that there are some things that would uh, be able to absorb, you know, solids, they don't absorb very well, but they might dissolve. So you might be able to put a solid into something and then it becomes more like a liquid or kind of breaks apart and dissolves. Kind of like my baking soda that I talked about earlier, I, that's a solid. I put solid grains of baking soda in here, but it dissolves in the water. So it doesn't really get absorbed necessarily. I wouldn't use the word absorb, I'd use the word dissolve. Uh, gases, I'm sure there's something that could uh, absorb or, or soak up some gases. I just don't know what that would be. Awesome. Some may get down to definitions too, right? When you mentioned dissolve, that really clicked for me. Of like, that's yeah, not really absorption, but it's taking something and integrating it into something mm -hmm. else. I know we know that happens with gases a lot that, you know, when two gases get together, they may mix to form another or something like that. So, um, so yeah, I think yeah. that's, uh, that's a uh, great question. And uh, yeah, I think a really good answer that, uh, you know, we, the general spirit of it, that things, you know, <laughs> two substances will merge to become one, whether we call that absorption or not, um, is, uh, is more, more, maybe more of a vocabulary issue than a, a scientific issue. So we'll, uh, we'll keep that open for now. Sure hey, another, we're jumping around experiment to experiment That's totally uh, fine. all the way back to the beginning. Um, so I wanted to know is, uh, is UV light essentially the same thing as blue light or how would you categorize that? So I guess it depends on, on what you're referring to when you talk about blue light. When we talk about light, we have what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's what all of our uh, uh, light and radiation kind of sits on in some sort of spectrum. And there's a section called visible light. And that's all the light that we can see. So that's like your red, your orange, your yellow, uh, green, indigo, violet, blue, your rainbow colors basically are in that visible light spectrum, not necessarily in that order, but they are in that spectrum. And so those are the colors that we see and they mix together and, and form the different colors we see. When we get to ultraviolet light, that's a type of radiation that we can't actually see. So uh, a black light is kind of, or, a, or I mean, my purple light here or whatever you may wanna call it, it's, it's kind of a, a makeshift of that. So it's not exactly true UV rays, but it's projecting out uh, colors that are really, really close to that. As you get further on the electromagnetic spectrum, you get into your blues and your violets, and then you right next to those are those ultraviolet rays, which is why it's called ultraviolet. It's it's the violet light. It's kind of that that wavelength still, but just a little bit extra, a little bit different, and a little bit further on that scale. So I, for me, when I hear blue light, like you asked about, I think of just a light that is blue. I don't necessarily think so much of like a uh, uh, a specific type of lighting instrument. But if something you might come across of, you know, my wife likes to do her nails all up and she has a little little light that they stick underneath of to, to dry and it's supposed to be uh, mimicking some UV light and they might call that a blue light online. I don't know what they would call that necessarily on the package. So maybe if that's what we're referring to, then they're the same thing. Uh, otherwise, I can't be certain. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. Lots of, uh, lots of vocabulary kind of questions. One quick one for you, if you know, uh, someone to know, why do they call it elephant toothpaste? That's a, you know what? 
I've been making it for years and I've never once thought to ask that question. I, I would guess it's because it is uh, a foamy, like a large foamy substance that kind of oozes out of a container, kind of like toothpaste does, especially the, the version that we did where it doesn't, you know, explode out of the top of the container, but it just kind of oozes on over. If you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, uh, it, you would have a similar effect. It would all kind of squeeze out in that cylindrical sort of shape. And so because it's large and foamy, it might look like uh, what a large animal like an elephant might use as toothpaste. I don't believe it's ever actually used for toothpaste or elephant. Uh, last I checked, uh, they get that from the grocery store, just like everybody else. So, Awesome. Thank you for that. Well, yeah, that, that sounds pretty logical the way you described it. So, and great questions, everybody. Maybe we'll eat with two more uh, less vocabulary driven ones. One of a lot of people want to know is, do you have a favorite science experiment or demonstration? Ooh, do I have a favorite science experiment or demonstration? I'll answer that in two ways. Um, my favorite one from today's set, I think, is the uh, disappearing beaker or the disappearing glass, because that was one that I learned recently and was very excited to try out and experiment with uh, a couple of days ago and then again today. And I, I think it's really cool. So from the ones I did today, I would say that's probably my favorite from up here. In general, um, anything that can be lit on fire or maybe has sort of that explosive uh, reaction. I definitely think is really, really neat. Uh, we do a lot with different schools and go out to different buildings. And so anything that is sort of that showstopper, uh, I really enjoy doing because it gets the, the audience really interested in it. And there's a lot of really neat science that goes behind how something burns. So I really like those ones. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Science is explosive. And uh, just like we love fireworks and, uh, and other things like that, chemistry is, uh, is similarly exciting. Again, make sure you've got supervision and permission. Um, but uh, there are all kinds of uh, explosive reasons to love science. And then the last one I thought was pretty interesting, although maybe it puts you on the spot for last, is someone wanted to know, have you ever invented your own experiment um, that you've used in, in a situation like this? And maybe we'll add to that. If you haven't, is there something you would like to tinker with? A, uh, you know, an experiment you've always loved to try for your own that you're not sure has been done before? Man, that's a really, really great question. Um, off the top of my head, the, the only experiments, I wouldn't go as far as to call them experiments. I would call them more demonstrations. I've come up with a couple different demonstrations, like um, how... Uh, your blood cells work and your white blood cells work to fight off infections. I have a couple different demonstrations that I've come up with for that. Uh, not so much experimenting or testing things out. I will say, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did an experiment where I was trying to change the color of a uh, flame. And so I was trying different chemicals to mix with and seeing if I burn this versus this, can I change and have a different colored flame? And for that, I came down, uh, down here actually, and put on my little lab coat and got my supplies that I researched for. And I kind of knew roughly what was going to happen. I didn't necessarily make it up all my own, but I did make some adjustments based off of the compounds I had available to me in our storage and in the museum and the different substances I had. So I tweak things from what I read more often than invent my own, but I have created my own demonstrations before. Yes. Awesome. That totally counts in our book. And actually, I think you kind of gave the blueprint for someone else, you know, who asked about what if we replace vegetable oil with syrup? That is an experiment, right? It's an iteration. So much of science is saying we've done these things and we know these things to be true. What if we tweaked one thing? What would happen differently? Like that is an experiment. So I think it totally counts. And we've even had people in, uh, in your questions today in the audience um, suggesting your own experience. So I think it's safe to say we've got Plenty of inventors and scientists among us. And uh, Ben, thank you. And, and everyone at Omaha Children's Museum for helping to inspire them to, you know, see sciences all around us. All of you out there, thank you so much for really insightful questions. I think we had, we had Ben on the hot yeah, seat. Yeah, those are great. Uh, here, but some great <laughs> questions and, and just really great critical scientific thinking. So, um with that, hey, Ben, thanks so much, Ben. This has been a really fantastic uh, class. Everybody out there, Omaha Children's Museum is back just about every month with us. So uh, if you enjoyed this, please tell a friend and uh, and come on back. And uh, in the meantime, here's some ways that uh, you can connect with Omaha Children's Museum and Varsity Tutors. And we'll, uh, we'll see everybody back here soon. Awesome. Thank you.